Good afternoon, Family Chapel. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, it is good to be with you here today. Uh, to those who are following along on our live stream, uh, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us. Um, well, I know for a lot of us, we are here under uh, not ideal, uncertain circumstances. Um, but we come to honor and worship the God who is constant, the God who is certain, who can we can be certain in his character and in who he is. And so as we come to worship our Lord today, uh, hear from Psalm 135, our call to worship. Can you rise with me for our call to worship today? This is God's word and God's call to you to come and join together in worship. It says this, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. And yes, as we come today, as we come in the midst of these trying and anxious circumstances, uh, we come, again, once again, are reminded that there is a God, that our God remains the same. He is a good God. Pleasant is his name. He is faithful in all his ways. And is this God who invites us to come and to rest in him, to lay down our fears, our anxieties, our burdens unto his feet. And it is him who can shoulder all of that, and him alone. And so at this time as we come, would you turn to God? Won't you turn to Christ our King and prepare your hearts to give him the praise that he alone deserves. Let's prepare our hearts together for worship at this time. Father, we come here once again, remembering that, oh Lord, that in even the most uncertain of times, Lord, the hope that we have in you, the promise which you have given to us is certain, is unshaking, it will never change. Oh Lord, in you we have a great hope. And Father, I pray, Lord, that in times like this, now more than ever, that our eyes and our hearts would turn to you once more, that we remember that you are the praiseworthy God, that you are the God who is good in all your ways, that you are the God whose faithfulness will never come to an end. And, O oh Lord, as we remember who you are, O oh Lord, would this time, would our lives continue to be filled with worship, whether it is here in, our, in this church or whether it is in our homes. Lord, wherever we are, would our lives be lives of worship unto your name. So, O oh Lord, would you be glorified today? And Lord, would our eyes and our hearts be once again centered on who you are. Thank you, O Lord. Thank you for inviting us here in this place once more. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to sing but your name.
as we continue our worship service, we actually want to take a time, uh, if we could pray together, enter into time of corporate prayer with just all that's going on. Uh, we realize and we understand that what we need most is our Lord to work, is Him to make a way. And the first step starts with us praying, being a church that is constantly in prayer. And so I wanted to lead you in two topics. First, would you pray for the world now? In the world, there is a lot of pain. People who are sick, there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And would you pray that God would provide, that there would be provision, that God would provide healing where healing is needed, but also that God would provide with the medical workers that are working on the field, that God would provide with all the people who are on the front lines, helping those who are in need, that he would strengthen them to work. But would you also pray that the world would see through this their great need for a savior, that they would see that the hope that this, they have in this world is not enough, it does not last, but that the world would see that they need someone greater. So would you pray for the world for provision, but that they would also too see Christ through this. Let's pray for the world at this time. Second, would you take the time to pray for our church? I know for the next few weeks, things may look and feel really different. Well, we might not be meeting together and uh, it might feel strange for some of us. But would you pray for our church that even in the midst of this, that our love for Christ would grow? Would you pray that our family here, that family chapel, the community that we have here would not fall apart, but would rather, would rather be strengthened by the unity that we have in Christ. And won't you pray that as a church, that we would be a light unto this world, that God would use our church to be a blessing so that the world would see the glory of our Savior. So at this time, let's pray for our church, pray for this community, pray for our heart, for the for Lord, that would grow even more in this season of life. So let's pray for our church together.
Father, Lord, we turn to you in this time. Lord, in this uncertain time in our lives, Lord, we turn to you, knowing that you are the God who is sovereign over all. Father, we know that what we are dealing with, disease, suffering, this pandemic that we face, it is a result of sin. Lord, it's just another reminder that this world is not our final home. And Lord, I pray, Father, that through this, that you would show that you are the Savior who has dealt with the ultimate problem of sin through your Son on the cross, that you have defeated sin and that you will reign victorious forever. And would you also show that you are the God who can turn sin into good, that you that sin does not have the final say. Oh Lord, won't you use this situation, won't you use all the pain that is found here, won't you use all the uncertainty, and Lord, through it all, Lord, would the final end be the glory of your name and the greatest good for your people. So Lord, I pray now that we would trust in you, that our church would trust in you, that our city would trust in you, that our nation and this entire world would trust in you and place their faith in you, our Savior. And so, Lord, as we gather once again, as we come to hear your word, I pray that you would speak to us and that, O oh Lord, that our confidence in you would be strengthened all the more. Thank you for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats at this time. Well, um, welcome once again to Family Chapel. Uh, it's really uh, just a, such a blessing to be here with you guys today. Uh, if you guys don't know me, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Chapel. And I'm just going to be giving us a time of announcements before we go into a time of our word. So if you could turn to the back of your bulletins with me, uh, we're going to be looking at some announcements together. Uh, the first announcement that I want to give is we want to welcome you to Family Chapel today. Uh, we're, again, so thankful that you're with us here today. And I know that there are a lot of circumstances which may have... Uh, pulled you or attempted you to not be here, which, uh, and we understand totally if, if that's the case, but, uh, but we're just so happy that we can gather together in this way. Um, but yeah, if you are new here and you would like to know more, more information about our church, we do still have a welcoming orientation, a newcomer's orientation led by our very own Lynn Park in the back over there. She would love to meet with you and just greet you, give you any information you might need about our church. Uh, but again, we want to just welcome you today, and we're so thankful that you are here with us. Uh, next announcement is for our Family Chapel Summer Missions Trip. Uh, the, I know currently with, the, with all that's going on, uh, some of the details about the trips are a little bit, are still being determined. However, we are still taking applications. And so for those of you who are interested in going uh, out this upcoming summer, we are still taking, uh, we are still taking applications for our Guatemala team, which is, uh, and the deadline for that is going to be on June 6th. And so if you would like more information about that, you can follow the bit, uh, the, the link that is provided right there. And you can also email missions at familychapel.com if you have any other questions about that. Uh, next announcement is for our newcomers luncheon. I know for some of you guys, uh, you guys might have received an email saying, for if you're a newcomer, that there is going to there is going to be a newcomers luncheon uh, this upcoming Saturday. But uh, just because of everything that's going on, it's going to, it is going to be postponed until further notice. And so uh, we apologize about that. Uh, we really did want to provide the space for you guys to get to know our church a little bit deeper. And so uh, we do promise that we will, uh, in in short, in due time, uh, uh, have, provide something once again. But until now, it is postponed until further notice. Uh, next announcement is the big one, uh, but it is with our COVID-19 uh, precautionary measures, um, you know, to protect the congregants of OMC and to limit the potential spread of, of this uh, pandemic, uh, we will most likely, uh, or we will definitely be having uh, online uh, services starting next Sunday. And so uh, starting next Sunday, we will not be gathering together, but rather we'll be switching to live streaming uh, through uh, Facebook, uh, through uh, YouTube Live and through our uh, church website. And so uh, starting from next week, if you guys could uh, make sure to tune in uh, through that, that would be great. Uh, the decision that we're making is not a decision that's based on fear. Uh, it's not something that we're making based on, you know, just panic, but rather we're really making decision based on love. Uh, we really do feel that as uh, just as public safety officials have said that this is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of this. We really want to love the world around us by by taking part in this. And so uh, please do not uh, think that, yeah, we're, we're running away from this in any way out of out of fear or out of panic but uh, we really want to love the world well and hopefully as we do so uh, you know we can see uh, healing being uh, 
happening uh, at a much faster rate. Uh, but until then, uh, yes, again, please uh, tune in to our live stream uh, along with us. We're going to be live streaming at 12.45 p.m. Uh, through, our, uh, through our website and YouTube. And, and we really do encourage you guys to, to take this opportunity to, to uh, really worship from home together well. I know it might feel different. I know it might feel weird uh, just worshiping on your own or in the, in, kind of like in the confines of your room. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, as we're saying, right, it's, it's really not about uh, just the location that we are, uh, we are singing in, but no, it's rather uh, we're singing in spirit together uh, as a spirit who leads us and is really as he is with us uh, that we can worship him. And so uh, please uh, tune in. Uh, please do not let your worship uh, be stifled or die out. But, but really, we hope and pray that through this time, through this uh, means, that our worship to God, our, our, our love for him, would only continue to be strengthened. And so uh, if you would like more information, uh, more information will be uh, announced on our Facebook page uh, throughout the course of this week. And so please be on the lookout for that. Uh, but that is uh, starting next week, we're going to be moving to live stream. And last but not least, uh, we are we do our, we are going to be having our Sunday lunch fellowship today. We're going to be meeting at Koreatown Galleria. And so for those of you guys who are comfortable with coming out, uh, we know that maybe not everyone would be, but if, if you guys are and would like to eat together, uh, we are providing that as well. So uh, we're going to meet at Koreatown Galleria after service. And so, um, but yeah, but again, thank you guys uh, for, for listening. And yeah, we're going to be going into time of our word. So why don't we at this time, uh, you know, get up and we can welcome and greet our neighbors uh, in a safe way, uh, but let us do so, and as we welcome a Pastor Daniel uh, to share God's word with us. All right, all right. Good to see everyone. Um, yeah, like Pastor Tim said, my name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the privilege of sharing the Word of God with you today. Um, and I think we are live, right? So just hello to everyone <laughs> joining us, uh, joining us wherever you are. Um, I don't even know where the camera is. I'm just waving somewhere. Um, but yeah, uh, this is uh, something that uh, yeah, we'll get through together as a church. So um, yeah, let's get into the time of the Word. Um, if you can turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 25, we're going to be reading up to chapter 4, verse 7. Um, you could either follow along also in your bulletin, or it'll also be posted on there. And for those of you who are live streaming at home, um, you can follow along maybe in your Bibles. So we'll be starting at Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. And the word of God reads, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Amen. That's the reading of God's word. And, um, you know, I know that things have been escalating just really at a dizzying pace. And um, I don't want to really tiptoe around the issue because I'm sure that's, you know, it's just on all of our minds. So I pray that today's message is a timely one because I truly believe that the truths that we're going to be looking at today will give us strength and a perspective in a time when our lives are affected, people around us are affected, you know, our identities are shaken, and our future is uncertain. And so um, let's look at this together and see what the Word of God says for us. You know, for the past few weeks, we've been looking at this idea, this, this doctrine of the do justification by faith. And I've mentioned this before, that justification has two implications. One of it was a legal one. And so this was the idea that uh, when by faith we are justified, it means that we're not guilty and that we are declared righteous. So this is the idea that if you're standing in front of a judge, the judge says, you may go now. 
Okay? But the other implication is this. The other implication is that it has a relational aspect to it. So this is the idea that it says, it doesn't just say you may go, but it also says you may come, and you may come in fellowship. So here in Galatians chapter 3 into chapter 4, we're looking at this relational aspect now um, that comes with justification by faith. And, you know, in the passages before, we've been learning the intended role and the purpose of the law to point out sin and to point us to Christ. And this is what the Jews knew for them as the Torah that they uh, uniquely received from God. But along with the law, the Jews believed that the other distinctive and essential identity was their heritage, that they were Abraham's offspring um, by circumcision. And so Paul, he's going to deal with a misconception that they also have. And what he wants to say is this, is that the true offspring of Abraham, the ones who really receive the blessing, is not based on ethnicity or works like circumcision, but rather it's also faith in Christ. So justification by faith, um, what we're going to learn today, is it leads to this whole new radical reality through Jesus, and it's this idea, this doctrine of divine adoption. Divine adoption. What it says is that you and I, by faith, have become sons and daughters of the Most High God. So let's really unpack what the verse says about divine adoption here today. So the first thing we're going to see is that divine adoption is a change in status. That first and foremost, this is a change in status and identity. So if you look at verse 26 through 28 in chapter 3, it says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what Paul begins to do is he paints this multiple pictures of the new reality that we are in. And he says, you are sons Okay? And what he's referring to here is not some kind of weird biological sense, but he's talking about legal heirs. Legal heirs through faith in Christ. And he goes on and he says, you have been baptized into Christ. And what baptism was, was this picture, this reenactment, a public declaration of an internal truth that has happened. And where we identify ourselves before a community and we say that we have died, uh, uh, we have died to our old life and we have rose again with Christ into the newness, into the newness of a new life in him. And then he says, having put on Christ. This is an expression that Paul loves to use, where he says that you have been clothed with Christ. And this alludes back to, obviously, Adam and Eve. You know, back then when sin came for them, when shame came upon their lives, they tried to cover themselves. They tried to clothe themselves. But not for Christians. The reality for us is that we are now clothed with Christ. So he points to these multiple realities, and then he points to a new primary identity that we have. Okay? When he says neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, or male nor male and female, he points to a unity that comes within the diversity. Okay? A unity in the diversity. He doesn't do away with all of our distinctions in some kind of weird literal sense, like there is no literal male or female, but rather he's unifying us under this primary ident identity now that we have in Christ even within all of our other different secondary identities. So we're different in a lot of ways, whether it's a race, social status, economic status, or gender, but we're all unified as sons and daughters of God. And so this is more significant in light of um, all the things that the Jews understood and the ancient cultures understood at the time, where they had a practice called primogeniture, where the Male sons, especially the firstborn, would be the ones inheriting everything. And so it was the Jews, the free, and it was the males that were understood, that they understood as we're the ones receiving Abraham's blessing. But not so with the gospel. Not, that's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that we are all heirs together by faith. So what this means is that we're no longer slaves, but by faith you have become full legal heirs with all of the privileges. All of the privileges. Because no matter what you see yourself as, no matter what you feel about yourself, when God sees you, he sees Christ. 
right? He sees a precious son or daughter. And a lot of times, I think at times, moments, we've all fallen into this temptation where we question, where we are tempted to think and doubt God's love and care for us, right? Does God, is God really care for me? Does he really love me? And I want you to ask in those moments, do you think God cares and loves Jesus, his son? And I know for a lot of us, we would think, of course, that's, Je- that's God's son. That's Jesus. Of course he loves and cares for him. Then I want to say to you, then there's no question what he thinks about you. There should be no doubt on what he views you as. John chapter 17, verse 26 says this. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This idea that Jesus prays and he says, Father God, I want you to love them as you have loved me with the same love. And that's so radical if you think about it, right? The same love that God has for his son, he, he's asking to, for God to love us. And that's the truth. That's the reality that we have for us. We, when God sees us, we have been clothed with Christ, and he loves you in the same way. And he views you in the same way. So we have to start with this truth, that divine adoption is first and foremost a status and an identity change. Because when you think about adoption, adoption is essentially not a behavior change, at least not at first, right? It's first a change in status and identity. And as the new identity sinks in more and more, then behavior will follow. It will slowly follow. And I saw this. I I don't know if any of you have ever visited an orphanage, okay? But back in 2014, when I was on a mission trip to Haiti, you know, this was during the time when Haiti was devastated by the earthquake. And most of the country was living in these tent cities. And it was pretty common to see kids kind of roaming around on the streets, um, you know, almost abandoned. And the orphanage would take in only really the kids whose parents have died or ran away. And a lot of times, parents would just drop their kids off at the orphanage. And what we would do is we would feed them but give them back. But the kids that were abandoned or their parents have died... You know, the the orphanage would take him in. And there was something that I noticed that I observed when I was um, at this orphanage. See, whenever new kids came, a lot of these kids carry with them this kind of orphan spirit, this, this, this feeling of abandonment and almost like a survival instinct within them. So it was pretty common to see that a lot of these new kids come in and they would fight, they would steal, they would eat off the floor. You know, a lot of them, some of them would even go hide in the corner with their food and try to eat as fast as they can. And you see, what was happening was a lot of them still carried this survival, the street survival instinct with them. And it was funny because no matter how many times you tell them, look, you don't have to do that. You don't have to eat off the floor. We have food for you. you don't, no one's going to steal your food. But they would still act in these ways. And it would take time for them to realize that they don't have to do that. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, I think it's the same for us. We've come out of spiritual slavery, yes, into this divine adoption, but know that it takes time for behavior to follow. And that's the mistake that I think a lot of people make is that I need to get my behavior somewhere first before God will accept me and adopt me. No, adoption is first and foremost a status change. You have been adopted now, and then the behaviors will come after So this is something that we have to realize. Then naturally, as you come to grips with this truth of divine adoption, the exhortation is this. Don't live like a slave now. Live like a son or daughter of God. Don't live like a slave. Live like a son or daughter of God. And Paul, what he does is he paints this analogy in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And it's this idea of being under guardians and tutors and managers See, in the Roman custom at the time, when there was a child, the child would be under a tutor until age 14. And at age 14, they would be called what is coming of age idea. And even when you came of age, you would still be under a curator, a guidance counselor, until 25 years old. And that's when you'll really receive your full inheritance and you'll really be able to be free from there. And what Paul says is that the law... Or whatever moral principle that people were governed by, the law was like that. It functioned like these tutors and these guides. So here's what this means. 
This means that if you're not a Christian today, you're still a slave under the law. You're still a slave to the law. Whatever moral principle, whatever way that you try to seek justification for yourself, you're still a slave and it'll lead to death. But Christians, Christians, the fullness has come, it says. The fullness and the adoption has come. And so Paul, what he's saying is, don't live as slaves. Live as sons and daughters of God. You see, one, one of the main differences between a slave and a son was the basis on which someone stayed in the household. Okay? One was based on works, and the other is based on identity. In modern terms, it's the difference between a tenant and a child. You see, uh, back when in our old house, you know, we used to have an extra room that we would rent out. And um, there was an exchange student from Korea, and he would stay with us, and he would study. And, you know, my mom, she would treat him like another son, and we would, you know, treat him kind of like family. But, you know, the truth is that um, no matter how much we would treat him like family, what is the basis on which he stayed in our house? Rent. He's got to pay rent, right? If this changes, then um, I'm sorry. Like, you got to get out. Um, that's how it was, right? And uh, it's much different than the basis in which I stayed in the home, right, when I was a child, Right? So as long as he pays rent, he stays, but I stay because I'm a child. And so the question is, is what's the basis on which you get to stay in God's house? Are you living like a tenant or are you living like a child? And the question is, how would you know, right? How do you know? How do you really know? And there's probably a lot of ways, but one of the ways is how do you respond to unanswered prayers? See, you see, if you live like a tenant and God doesn't give you the answer that you want, you'll either be cold and angry because you will say, well, I've been paying my rent. I've been paying my spiritual rent. I've been doing my duties. How could God do this to me? Or you'll live in fear. You'll live in anxious fear because maybe you haven't been paying your spiritual rent. And you're going to think, man, God's going to just kick me out. God's going to punish me. That's living like a tenant. And I don't think this misconception is very uncommon in the church. You know, I, I see this a lot. I've been, you know, tutoring high school students for the past several years now. And, you know, you come across very interesting parents. And I remember one lady came to me, and she was a deacon at her church. And she also knew that I served in ministry. So um, she came up to me, and I noticed she was just visibly upset. And then she started just complaining to me and venting to me. Um, and, you know, she would call me Chonosanim, and, you know, that's another way to say pastor. And she, would, she was just venting to me how her son didn't get into Stanford, right? And she was saying, how could God not let my son get into Stanford? And the reason was she was explaining, well, she's been tithing extra. She's been going to morning prayer every day. She's been serving at her church extra. And she was saying, how could God do this? And, um, you know, I, I don't know what I said to her, right? I, I think I tried to calm her down a little bit. But, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, this lady has no concept of what Christianity is. And you know what, though? At the time, I was pretty upset because I found out that her son did get into UCLA. And she was so mad about that. And, I, and she didn't know I graduated from UCLA. So I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I just want to, like, tell her off right now. But, you know. Right, some parents, it's just like that, right? Like, but she, she was living at, like a tenant, right? And, you know, the, that's a question that we have to begin to ask ourselves. Don't live like a tenant. Don't live like a slave. You're a child, right? Are you a slave or are you a son or daughter of God? And if you're a son or daughter of God, live like one. And so you might be thinking, well, Pastor Daniel, I see that. I agree with that. You know, I want to live like a son or daughter of God, yes, you know, but, you know, can you explain a little bit more what that looks like? And I'm glad you asked. Um, those of you at home, I'm glad you asked. I, I know that's what you're asking. You know, and so this is where we get to our second point here. You know, uh, the second idea is that divine adoption is a change in relationships as well. This is a glorious truth. Well, I, want, I want you guys to really just pay attention to this. Uh, I'm going to turn your attention to chapter 4, verse 6. And it says, and because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, 
One of the things I want to tell you is the way that you can enjoy this divine adoption is to live in light of the changed relationships that you have. And here's what I mean. Your relationship with God is radically different, right? Because the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to help us to live and to experience, to realize as you truly are. Remember the status change? That you're a son or daughter of God. The Holy Spirit wants you to experience that. And how does he do that? It says it right here. It helps us to cry out, Abba, Father. See, it's not just this legal status change. There's actual experience by the Holy Spirit. And this idea of crying out, this is a connotation of nearness and intimacy to God. And, um, you know, parents with newborns will understand this. You know, Pastor Tim will know this. When a newborn, a child, all he has to do is just to cry out and the parents jump into action. That's how it is. And this word right here, Abba. Now, if, if you've ever heard about this word or if you've ever studied this word, I know a lot of the sentiment around this word means that it was like a word that we like to equate as daddy in English. But let me just say this. I, I, I don't think that's fully accurate because um, this word Abba was actually even used by adults. Okay? And it was used to refer to, obviously, their, their, their dad. But... Um, the reason why I don't think daddy is that accurate is because um, I don't think adults really call their dads daddy, right? Like, um, I, I don't know if you do, but I, I don't. Um, I think, honestly, this is, a, this is a probably an area where um, a lot of Asians might understand it better, and even Korean understands it better. And ours sounds closer, too, right? We say appa, and I think that's closer. Because even as adults, I call my dad appa still, right? As a, as a child and when you grow up, I don't call him this formal word, right? I don't call him what in Korean, the formal way, like abonim or aboji and stuff like that. Maybe you do, but I don't. You know, it's, it's just some of the things that we realize. And this is a personal thing. This is an intimate thing. I don't call other people's parents appa, right? That'd be weird, right? Um, I'm sure you don't either. Um, and so this is more a term of endearment and intimacy and personal relationship. And it assumes the love and care of the parent. And so as a parent, I'm sure it would be hurtful if your child came to talk to you with hesitation, um, if the, especially if the child doubts whether you really love or care for them. And I'm sure it's the same with God. You've got to understand the access that we now have, that you get to cry out, Abba, Father, in such a personal, intimate way. And we have a God who's going to take care of you and he's going to provide for you. That's why Jesus in Matthew 7 says this, Which one of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And sometimes I wonder if we view God as a worse parent than we would be. God forbid, right? But God cares. God's going to take care of you. And especially in a time like this, Family Chapel, especially in a time like this, you have unlimited, uninhibited, intimate access to the sovereign God of the universe through the Spirit. So cry out. Cry out, Abba, Father, to him and pray. Pray like you really believe in this glorious privilege you have as a son or daughter. Pray like you really believe it. And he, Paul says, look, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free, right? And he says, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And the other relationship that we get to enjoy as sons and daughters is that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. There is this community. And what God has given to us is this extended family to care for and to fight for together with one another. And we understand, look, there's going to there's pe- there's gonna be people within our body who are suffering. There will be fellow believers who have friends and family that they love who will be suffering, right? How should we respond as brothers and sisters in Christ? And you know, while that's not a simple answer, I understand. I know that one way we can respond is in radical sacrifice and care for one another. What I mean by that is we can live like people whose hope is not in this world. It's, our hope is on the things to come. And this brings us to our last point here. 
Divine adoption points to a glorious hope. Divine adoption is a glorious hope. You know, one aspect of sonship that we might not emphasize or think about enough is this idea of inheritance, that we are heirs, that we are heirs in Christ, okay? And this was huge, not only for the Jews, but you got to understand, this was huge for the early Christians who were suffering at the time, right? That there was an eternal hope to look forward to no matter what would happen in this life on earth. And I won't equate what we're going through with what the early church faced. Yes, I know. But in light of the present sufferings of the world that we're facing now, should we not meditate even more on how we are to live in light of eternity? Let me read for you guys 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. Now, I want you to really just pay attention to these words. I, I really do think these words will, will encourage you today. Follow along with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 9. It'll be up on the screen for you. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Family Chapel, look, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a living hope. And this gives us strength to impact those around us. You see, when it points to heirs, and it says we're heirs to this Abrahamic blessing through Jesus. And I want to just say, look, the intention of the Abrahamic covenant was this, that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this was a global initiative that was ultimately set in place to Christ. And what basically that means for us, look, is that you are blessed, you and I are blessed, so that we can be a blessing to others. So I just want to end with this, with some application things to think through. Hey, the first thing is this. In a time of crisis, let it be a time of reflection. To slow down a bit and reflect. Look, let your identity as sons and daughters of God be strengthened even more at this time. Because every other identity is proven to be fragile, isn't it? Whatever you define yourself as, every other identity is shaken a little bit, isn't it? It's proven to be fragile. But not this identity. We are sons and daughters of God, and that will never be taken away. And I want you to think through what that means for you. Also, as it says, let your faith be tested and purified, because we're going to have to put our trust in our Abba Father. The second thing is, in a time of crisis, let it be an opportunity. Let it be an opportunity to testify of our firm foundation. Right? We have a living hope that no matter what happens or what we face today, we have hope. And that's something the world in panic out there needs to see. Right? You see it all across. You probably come across it yourself if you go to the stores. You know, people just panicking, doing just different things. But we should live like ones who have hope. And because we have hope, we can radically love others. We can sacrificially love others. Like many people are going to be tempted now to only look out for themselves. But we as Family Chapel, look, we can sacrifice. We can care for others. And so I'll just end with this. Family Chapel, do not take this glorious truth of divine ad adoption lightly. I don't know if any of us have ever adopted a child or adopted a child, but I don't think I have to convince you that it comes with great cost. So lastly, let me say this. Be reminded of the great cost that it took for you and I to become sons and daughters of God. What did it cost God the Father to adopt us? 
I want you to know that the, the, for the Jewish people at the time, they mostly knew God as Father in an impersonal way, in a general national sense as God is this Father of Israel. And therefore, even just this personal understanding of God the Father was less relational but more ethnic. They just saw it as more of a metaphorical picture, not as an essential quality. And imagine then this rabbi comes along. And he's always saying, Abba, Father. People back then, they didn't say this. But he was always saying, Abba, Father, in this radical, personal way. Talking to God, not only as a deity to obey, but a relationship to enjoy. And he would even teach us to pray, Abba, Father, right? He would always say, Abba, Father, who art in heaven, right? Even on Gethsemane, he would say, Abba, Father, take this cup away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He would always pray, Abba, Father. Do you know the only time he did not pray Abba, Father was? Was when he was on the cross. You see, when he was on the cross, what did he do? He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabastani. And it says, it's translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the only time God, Jesus cries out and he doesn't say, Abba, Father, or my Father. Because on that cross, Jesus' fellowship with his Father was ripped apart so that you and I can become adopted as children of God. You see, the Son of Man, the Son of God became man so that man can become sons of God. And I think this is why... Apostle John, in his epistle, even in his old age, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he almost seems to cry out in exclamation at this glorious truth. And he says, see, he says, behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So Family Chapel, I want you to see. I want you to look. I want you to behold. Look. We are sons and daughters of God, and we are precious brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have a hope that will never change or be taken away. Jesus paid with his blood for this, and our Abba Father will get us through these difficult times. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you crying out, Abba, Father. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, help us. We thank you for sending your son, your precious son, Jesus Christ, to shed his blood so that we can be your sons and daughters, secure. With full hope, they'll never be taken away. Father, let this truth sink so deeply into our hearts. Let it strengthen us. Let it purify our faith. And let it help us to get ready for whatever you have in store for us. And whatever way that you desire to use us to get glory from our lives, Lord Father, in the days to come. So we glory in this today. As your sons and daughters, we praise your name and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, if we could just rise for a time of reflection.
for you are worthy. Abba Father, help us through these times and we will worship as a body of Christ we will worship no matter what comes we glorify your name that you call us sons and daughters of, your, of yours and we will just continue to Lord live in that truth and Lord we will hope we will live like those who have ultimate hope we have eternal hope and so Father use us Use us to glorify your name. Use us to bless those around us. Even in these times, Lord, may you receive the glory that only you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.